Steve Ayer McNair was a popular and beloved retired quarterback with the Tennessee Titans who was known for his dedication to community and for being a family man. But Steve had a secret, namely his 19-year-old girlfriend, Jenny Kazimi. And while Steve was promising Jenny that they would be together forever, she decided to make sure that they would be. Hello and welcome to The Dark Side of Love. I'm your host, Bianca Sloan, author of suspense novels about the dark side of love. And this week I'm putting a spotlight on the case I'm calling Touchdown to Murder. Stephen Latriel McNair came into the world on Valentine's Day of 1973. One of five boys born to single mother Lucille McNair in Mount Olive, Mississippi a tiny town with a population of less than 1,000 people and a one-lane highway in and out of town. Steve's interest in football began as a little boy when he was tagging after his older brother, Fred, who had become a local football star, the first in the family to wear the number nine jersey that Steve himself would make famous one day. Steve attended Mount Olive High School, becoming a triple threat in basketball, football, and baseball. And because apparently he didn't need sleep, He ran track in his spare time. Clearly a gifted athlete, Steve was an all-state selection and Super Prep magazine named him an All-American. The University of Florida offered the talented quarterback a scholarship, but he opted for the HBCU, that's a historically black college university. He decided to go to Alcorn State University, located near tiny Lorman, Mississippi, which, as ESPN.com noted, is known for the old country store, which is famous for its fried chicken. During his freshman year, Steve met Michelle Cartwright in a human anatomy class. Michelle was less than interested in the star quarterback, but Steve's goofy sense of humor eventually won her over and they soon became inseparable. Steve was also making his mark on the football field, carving out what would eventually be a legendary college football career. He was the NCAA's all-time leader in offensive yards, which earned him Southwestern Athletic Conference Player of the Year honors four years running. As if that wasn't enough, he was finalist for the 1994 Heisman and won the 1994 Walter Payton Award as the top player at a Division I school. In 1995, Steve went as the third pick overall in the NFL draft, going to the Houston Oilers, later known as the Tennessee Titans. He eventually became the starting quarterback in 1997 and led the team to the Super Bowl in 1999. He was traded to the Baltimore Ravens in 2006 before finally retiring in 2008 after 13 years in the league, telling ESPN that, quote, physically, I couldn't do it anymore, following a string of injuries and surgeries. Retirement would also allow him to spend more time with his family. Steve and Michelle, his college sweetheart, had married in 1997 and had two sons, Tyler and Stephen Jr. Stephen also had two other children from two previous relationships. In addition to spending more time with his kids, Steve dedicated himself to building his business and philanthropic interests, establishing the Steve McNair Foundation to serve underprivileged kids and hosting uh, football camps. He also got into the restaurant business, opening Gridiron 9, which was a fast, casual spot near Tennessee State University, meant to be an affordable option for students to eat. Steve seemed to be putting his post-NFL career to good use, appearing to avoid the pitfalls of retirement from professional sports. As his teammate Eddie George told the Tennessean, quote, when you transition from the game, mentally and physically and emotionally transition, You go through so much change. Just imagine going from what you do every day and all of a sudden you're forced into doing something different. However, spending time with family and cultivating his business and philanthropic interests wasn't the only thing that Steve got up to in retirement. In other words, Steve had girlfriends and in particular, he had a much younger girlfriend. 19-year-old Sahel Kazimi, also known as Jenny, was a diminutive waitress with long black hair and olive skin. She worked at Dave & Buster's in Opry Mills, that's a shopping mall, in Nashville, when she met the 35-year-old Steve. Her co-workers described her to ESPN as a pretty girl who smiled and joked around and displayed a tireless amount of energy. A native of Tehran, Iran, Jenny was one of five children being raised by her single mother. 
When Jenny was nine, her mother was murdered in a brutal robbery home invasion. Jenny was supposed to be there, but through a uh, twist of fate, she was not home that night, and her young life was spared. Jenny, who was described by ESPN.com as a happy-go-lucky tomboy, seemed oddly to take the tragedy in stride, adopting an almost philosophical view of her mother's murder and death in general. Another sister, Azadeh Kazimi, told ESPN.com about her sister, quote, I talk about death all the time, especially after my mom passed away. She, meaning Jenny, she never did that. We had long conversations, and she'd say, when you're dead, you're dead. After her mother's murder, Jenny moved to Turkey before immigrating to the United States on August 29, 2002, landing in Jacksonville, Florida with another sister, Sohela, who became her guardian. 13-year-old Jenny didn't speak the language, though according to ESPN.com, she seamlessly integrated into the world of being a typical American teenager, including hanging out at the mall and developing crushes on boys. She also learned to speak English in addition to Farsi and Turkish. However, while Jenny may have yearned to be an all-American girl, according to what one friend told ESPN.com, she still didn't quite fit in and was frequently picked on in school for being different. Her nephew, Farzan Abdi, told ESPN that his aunt had, quote, behavioral problems while in high school, so I'm guessing she was probably acting out um, because she was getting picked on. When Jenny was 16, she met aspiring rapper 20-year-old Keith Norfleet, eventually dropping out of high school to move to Nashville to be with him. By December of 2008, they'd broken up and drifted apart, which is about the time that Jenny met Steve when he was seated in her section at Dave & Buster's. Friends doubt that she even knew who Steve was, but one thing was clear. The former Tennessee Titan was exceedingly generous, often leaving tips for, her, for the servers of over 50%. Despite being married with children, Steve began a relationship with Jenny, and it seemed like it was an open secret, as the couple took vacations to Florida, Hawaii, Las Vegas, they're hanging out in VIP rooms, they're going parasailing. And in fact, he spent so much time at her apartment that her neighbors thought he must have been moving in. Jenny introduced Steve to her family, and she said that the couple visited his family back in Mississippi. Jenny was, in fact, getting pulled deeper and deeper into Steve's orbit. She'd always been fiercely independent, known to work two, sometimes three jobs in order to make ends meet, determined to stand on her own two feet. However, the longer that she was with Steve, the more comfortable she seemed with letting him take care of her. For example, she'd cut back her hours at work, and for her 20th birthday, which is May of 2009, she allowed him to co-sign on a black Cadillac Escalade, though she decided to make the payments on it, an attempt at maintaining some semblance of independence. Steve had begun to tell Jenny that he was pulling the plug on his 12-year marriage so that the two of them could be together. So while it seems as though Jenny is his number one girl, aside from his wife, I guess, um, in fact, Steve had another girlfriend, 25-year-old Leah Ignani. According to Leah, she met Steve in early May of 2009, which is about the time of Jenny's birthday and him uh, buying Jenny the car. Um, and he and Leah, they, they quickly begin dating. Like Jenny, Leah was a petite, dark-haired girl with olive skin, so I guess Steve had a type in girlfriends. Uh, Steve kept a condo in downtown Nashville where he and Jenny had their trysts, and that's also where he had his hookups with Leah. And I guess this is kind of common uh, with professional athletes. Like, they have their big, nice house in the suburbs, but then they have, like, kind of a stopover place in the city, um, kind of away from home, uh, so they can have their, their hookups. And just like Jenny, Steve is telling Leah a lot of the same things about his marriage, that he's in the process of getting divorced from Michelle, it's been going on for two years, and he's telling Leah how much he loves her, and if she would just wait for him, it'll be over soon. But unlike Jenny, Leah is not buying what Steve is selling, because she says that she was being realistic, and that she knew she was not about to become the next Mrs. McNair, that she was well aware of just what her relationship was with Steve. Leah noticed during the month of June that she was being followed by a woman in a black Escalade, which is Jenny, uh, when she was leaving that condo downtown, and that she had noticed that same car on her street where she lived 
uh, circling the block. And she'd seen this for a good couple of weeks. Um, she doesn't know that it's Jenny, but she knows something's not right. On July 1st, Jenny told a friend that she had found used condoms in the trash at the condo. Jenny now decides to confront Steve, and he did what men with side chicks and wives do, which is to tell Jenny that she's the only one, she's the one who has his heart, and never you mind about that other girl. As the Tennessean reported, a distraught Jenny wasn't buying it, telling her ex-boyfriend Keith, quote, I know the truth about what he's doing. He's been lying to me the whole time. However, as the Tennessean also noted, getting over Steve was not easy for Jenny. She dated other guys, rationalizing to her sister Azade in Australia, quote, I was faithful to him, but if he's going to do that, I'm going to do the same. Except she could not stay away from Steve and began to convince herself that he was on the brink of divorcing his wife so that the two of them could live happily ever after. Steve consumed Jenny to the point that she even took a total stranger into her confidence regarding the relationship. As the San Diego Union Tribune reported, in late June of 2009, Vera Mosley Buckner, a customer at Dave & Buster's, was seated in Jenny's section. And after asking if she could talk to Vera, Jenny took a seat across the table from the woman and asked her, quote, have you ever been in love? before describing the heartache that she was experiencing over Steve McNair. Like she's telling her, I'm dating this football player. You know, these are all the trips that were going on, all the uh, time that we've been dating. We've been dating for eight months, and now she doesn't know what to do. Um, I mean, it's, it's kind of sad that someone she doesn't even know, and she's pouring her heart out to this, this woman. Now, it is against this backdrop of romantic heartache that Jenny is also having financial difficulties. So that Escalade that Steve co-signed for and that Jenny was making the payments on, well, those $800 a month car payments are way above her pay grade. And in fact, she still had a much more economical Kia that she was making payments on as well, though she had turned that car over to a friend for them to take on the payments. On top of that, her roommate had moved out, and so now her rent has doubled, as well as the utilities and, and frankly, the business of living. I mean, she's got to put gas in the car, she's got to eat, uh, you know, make a CVS run. I mean, life life is expensive. Um, things went from bad to worse when the friend who was supposed to be making payments on the Kia asked Jenny to take the car back. So now she's back to two car notes and now with one that's behind on payments. So she's feeling uh, stressed, <laughs> to say the least. Now, friends and family say that Jenny was about to move in with Steve into that condo in uh, downtown Nashville. And toward that end, she had started listing her furniture on Craigslist, anticipating that she and Steve would be moving in together. I mean, uh, frankly, she also could have been trying to sell her furniture so that she could make some quick cash in order to catch up on her bills. Um, and because if things can get worse, they do. On July 2nd, Jenny and Steve were in her car, that Escalade, and uh, they're driving. Uh, and the chef from his recently opened restaurant, Gridiron 9, Vint Casper Gordon, he was in the back seat. Uh, so they're out driving, and the cops pull them over and arrest Jenny on DUI charges when she refused a breathalyzer. Steve and Vint, they get in separate cabs, they take off, and Jenny goes to jail. Now, Steve did bail her out, but of course she's ticked because he, hasn't, he doesn't come to pick her up from jail, and it turns out... The reason why he didn't come pick her up is that after all of this, he's gone to Leah's apartment at four in the morning. His teammate, Eddie George, summed up Steve's actions pretty succinctly when he told the Tennessean, quote, I'm pretty sure that he, meaning Steve, was dealing with some things that we don't know about. Clearly. Something else that's clear. Jenny is beyond stressed about her relationship with Steve and about her financial woes. And it seems she starts to make a plan. On July 3rd, she bought a 9 millimeter pistol for 100 bucks from a man by the name of Adrian Gilliam. This is a guy that she met outside of a Hooters a few weeks earlier. According to Dateline, Andrew Gilliam, as it turns out, was on parole for second-degree murder and attempted robbery, which means as a convicted felon, 
it's illegal for him to own a gun. So that means he could go to jail. Now, he tells police later that the whole reason he sold uh, Jenny this gun is because he was strapped for cash. Later that night, after purchasing this gun, Jenny says to her manager, quote, my life is just shiz, and I should end it. Throughout the day, July 3rd, an increasingly panicked Jenny was texting Steve about the stress that she was experiencing, even asking him to transfer $2,000 to her account. He tells her, calm down, drink some water, everything is going to be fine. At 10.05 a.m., Jenny sends this text message to Steve. Baby, I might have a breakdown. I'm so stressed. 10.06, Steve says, everything's going to be okay. 10.21 from Jenny, baby, I might need to go to the hospital. Baby, what's wrong with me? I can hardly breathe. 10.27 a.m., Steve, where are you? 10.30 a.m., Jenny, I just want this pain in my chest to go away. The text messages pick up in the afternoon, 4.04 p.m., Jenny texts Steve and says, baby, I have to be with you tonight. I don't care where. 4.16, she says to him, tell me you're going to be with me. Steve does not respond to either text. Later that night, Jenny resumes texting with Steve again telling him again she needs to see him that night, specifically asking if he wants to go get a drink. He tells her that he's putting his kids to bed and that he probably won't be able to meet up with her. In reality, Steve has been out fishing all day and is actually making plans to go meet up with some friends of his at a local bar. At 10 o'clock, Jenny clocks out of Dave and Buster's and heads over to Steve's condo. She texts him at around 11.30 to ask if his kids are asleep yet, and Steve says just about. Now, remember, Steve is not home, tucking his kids in. He's at the club with his friends. And so, Jenny waits. July 4th, 2009, 12.38 a.m. Steve is leaving a Nashville bar called Losers and texts Jenny to let her know that he's on the way to the condo. Steve is dropped off at the condo between 1.15 and 1.30 in the morning. At some point after coming in to the condo, Steve sits down on the sofa and he falls asleep. Jenny takes the gun that she had just purchased the day before and shoots a sleeping Steve four times, twice in the head, twice in the chest. She then sits down next to him, raises the gun to her head, and pulls the trigger. Steve McNair was 36 years old. Jenny Kazimi was 20. Jenny had attempted to position herself so that she would fall into Steve's lap when she died. However, she ultimately slid down to the floor and she was found at Steve's feet, the gun underneath her head. The violent deaths send shockwaves through Nashville. The brutality of it was horrifying. People were stunned to learn that Steve had this double life, these, uh, these other girls, this young girlfriend. And uh, now his wife, Michelle, she told ESPN.com, quote, I didn't know about her at all, meaning Jenny. And did I know about some other people and some other things? Yes. But did I know about her? No, I did not. And most importantly, I know this is a surprise, there was no pending divorce. There had been no papers filed. And in fact, the couple was looking for a new house. Not somebody that sounds like they're on the verge of a divorce. Steve was considered a hero in Nashville a beloved football player who was a tireless advocate for the community, someone who tipped generously, was a family man who attended his son's football games, never turned down an autograph request. And you know, it's always a shock to not only lose your heroes, but to learn that they were less than perfect. That's a double blow. As the late Mark Howard, then the host of 104.5's The Wake Up Zone, told the Tennessean, quote, you have to understand, Steve was the leader of a group of Tennessee Titans who brought pro football to Nashville and went to the Super Bowl. That group was kind of a special love. Your first love is always special. There's something about that team that people hold near and dear to them. 
He was the first pro football hero that played here, and he was a very humble guy, very approachable, and people loved him for that. There was rampant speculation that this could not have been a murder-suicide, that there was something more sinister going on. There were a number of inconsistent witness statements. There was the out-of-character behavior by Jenny, the fact that Steve only had like 6 or $7 in his pocket when normally he would carry thousands of dollars, and what Jenny's family says was her general unease around guns. However, the investigation revealed traces of gunpowder residue on Jenny's left hand, um, there was the position of the gun under her head, um, the indentation of the gun, the, the blood, uh, the pattern of the blood, the fact that she had purchased a gun, her insistence that Steve spend time with her that night, not to mention the state of mind that she was in in those days leading up to July 4th, specifically her financial woes and her worries about Steve cheating on her. So all in all, investigators concluded that yes, indeed, this was a murder-suicide. Steve was laid to rest in Hattiesburg, Mississippi on July 11, 2009, and among the NFL stars who spoke at the packed service included Ray Lewis and Vince Young. Jenny was buried in Jacksonville, Florida, the words, My Little Angel, inscribed on her grave marker. Steve's friends, fans, and family, they still have a hard time wrapping their heads around what happened and the secret life that he was living. As his former teammate Eddie George told the Tennessean about his friend, quote, he was probably searching for something, things in the wrong places. Steve has continued to receive numerous accolades over the years, being named 35th greatest quarterback by Football Nation in 2012, having his number nine jersey retired by the Titans in 2019, and being inducted into the Black College Hall of Fame in 2012 and the College Football Hall of Fame in 2020. Greg McCrary, a former FBI agent with a background in profiling, assessed Jenny's attempt at falling into Steve's lap after she turned the gun on herself as an effort at posing, saying it seemed as though she was, quote, trying to have her body on his. It's as though it's a symbolic kind of possession. This guy is mine. I'm on him. In one of the text messages that Jenny sent to Steve in the early morning hours of July 3rd, before she shot him to death 24 hours later, Jenny asks Steve if he loves her. After he says he does, Jenny declares, quote, I'm going to have all of you soon. Thank you so much for joining me for another episode of The Dark Side of Love. I'm your host, Bianca Sloan, and show your love for The Dark Side of Love by visiting thedarksideoflove.com for show notes and transcripts. While you're there, sign up for my newsletter to be notified about new episodes. And while you're there, you can also find a link to my Patreon page where you can access bonus material and other fun stuff. Learn more about my suspense novels about The Dark Side of Love by visiting biancasloan.com. Thanks for hanging out with me and join me next time for another tale of love gone wrong. I'll see you on the dark side.